forget the sequel. Don't forget the sequel. Don't forget the sequel. Don't forget the sequel. Oh. Oddly enough, you could kind of count the second film as a remake as well as a sequel. The first 10 minutes recaps the first film, updated with a bigger budget and a slightly different story that leads into the rest of the film. We get more of a background of the Necronomicon and that it's a passage to another world with the oh-so-good 80s special effects. As well as actually seeing a clip of the professor behind the recording, kind of like a family-oriented Indiana Jones. There's your dose of 80s. This time around, it's only Ash and Linda who go to the cabin. She still has her necklace, and they discover the book. The big difference is the circumstance to which they are at the cabin. I feel funny about being here. What if the people who own this place come home? They're not going to come back. Even if they do, we'll tell them that the car broke down or something like that. <laughs> With your car, they'd believe it. Yay! Trespassing! Hopefully, the owner doesn't carry a shotgun. Oh, no. Like the last film, this one loves to introduce key items and moments and reuse them in a different light for later. One of those key moments is the dance number between a loving Ash and Linda. Awww. Then Ash listens to the recording and at least this time around the professor recited the incantation out of research and not making the mistake of reciting it after knowing the harm it causes. More smarter! The same point of view track shot returns and assaults Linda. Ash looks for her in the woods and again, better reason to be out in the woods than what was that noise? But this time around, Linda is immediately possessed instead of gradually, which takes away from the emotional weight of the couple's tragedy from the last film, but the better makeup sure does make her creepier. We get the same shovel decapitation, burial, and point of view charging scenes. This is where the story continues as we see some crazy camera work spin Ash around and reveal that his fate is another possession. Only to be healed by the sun, the kryptonite of the dead. So the beginning is much quicker paced than the original film and offers some new creative scenarios, but at the cost of having no time to absorb or feel the emotional weight of Ash and Linda's tragedy from the original, which feels shallower and takes away from some of the fear. However, the film makes up for that the next day. Ash tries to escape the woods by showing off their bigger budget compared to the last film. We actually see the destroyed bridge. And how the hell did the spirits do that? So, later that night, the point of view chases Ash around in an interesting and unique single shot. And did we really just have a Looney Tunes scene there? Uh, they went that away. Finally, the emotional scene, Ash sees Linda's necklace, which gives us a picture of how Ash feels about his loss. Now, if only we knew more about Linda in order to feel bad about her. But speaking of whom... Linda returns with a dance number like Jack Skeleton from Nightmare Before Christmas. And since I am dead, I can take off my head to recite Shakespearean quotations. No animal nor man can scream like I can with the fury of my recitations. Though I prefer the human connection of Ash and Linda's eye game from the last film, this is a creative alternative, allowing a corpse bride look-alike taunt Ash and have chilling contrast to their previous musical number. Well done. And yes, granted the animation is pretty dated, but still has its charm. And of all scenes, this could definitely use an update. Wink, wink. We then transition from Linda's head scaring the crap out of Ash to him finding reality being bent around him. Starting with him being in a chair when he doesn't remember sitting down, talking to himself in the mirror, choking himself, and laughing along with a room full of inanimate objects. Cool, cool concept, almost as of giving us the impression that all of this is in a psychotic's head, turning the horror ride into a cerebral trip, allowing for a more grounded and darker story. Or maybe it's Cthulhu. But, pfft. He gets bit by Linda's decapitated head and can't shake her off like a dog to the crotch. Or a mini-me in Austin Powers. He vices the head off and, really, how are we supposed to take this scene seriously? You're going down. The head tries to trick him like the last film, but we ultimately get the infamous chainsaw scene. Or... what? 
Yes! That's what I'm talking about! You have a normal situation that seems safe, and then you get the scary, inevitable truth. Yes, a scary question, you get a scary, inevitable answer, good suspense, good payoff, and yet still somehow maintains its funny tone. Kudos to this film! Even so, it might be a tad silly, especially when you add this kind of music to it. Even the blood on the light bulb makes a return, but used more effectively, turning the entire room red as if representing the terror and adrenaline. We're then introduced to the rest of the cast. Yeah, about time. The professor's daughter, Annie, her boyfriend, whose name you will never remember anyway, a redneck named Jake, and his girlfriend, Bobby Joe, who helped them around the bridge to reach the cabin. And during this time, Ash deals with his most recent episode, where only his hand is possessed after being bit from Linda's head. Curious detail how the possession seemed to happen like an infection. Most of the time. Even in the last film, even the effect on Ash's hand or Linda's foot have an infection aesthetic to them. The whole hand gag becomes a series of slapstick as Ash tries to survive. And now Roger Rabbit on the brain. The most memorable part, of course, is when Ash chainsaws the hand off, to which the hand continues to carry on the comedic routine. But amidst all the chaos, Ash fires a shotgun, accidentally attacking one of the members of the new cast. They of course assume he's a psycho and that he off the professor, and so throw him down the trap door. you think this would be one of those slow, truth-revealed plot lines, but surprisingly, they figure it out pretty quick after listening to the professor's recording. During which the scene leads to another great buildup of suspense. Henrietta is dead. I could not bring myself to dismember her corpse. I dragged her down the steps, and I buried her. I buried her in the cellar. God help me, I buried her in the earthen floor of the fruit cellar. Of course, the other characters let Ash out, but the possessed mother... God, is that the Crypt Keeper? And hey, that shot looks familiar. At least Sam Raimi loved the gag enough to reuse it in one of his later films. <laughs> And again, another detail reused from the first movie is having the demons trick the characters by having the possessees acting normal again. And granted, this concept is very disturbing that a predator toys with its prey by taunting them with hope that their loved ones can fight them off and attain a happy ending. Or maybe they're dead already and the demons are just impersonating them for shits and giggles. Those jerks. Can't say it's all that terrifying in these particular movies, mostly because it's so obvious and because of the comedic flair, but again, in a remake or other movie, this would be a great horrific scene, toying with the audience's emotions and faking out hope. That would be scary. But anyway, they don't fall for the professor's wife's tricks, but then the boyfriend is arbitrarily possessed. Odd, considering this is the first time in either movie where possession takes place without some kind of contact. I mean, check out these other times here. Though Linda, you could argue, didn't have a physical contact either, but she was supposedly struck by the point of view shot that we never see the other side of anyway. So, I digress. The boyfriend attacks them, and what's up with that mask? Is that something left over from the set of Beetlejuice? And cue in the movie tagline. Is that what the demons want? The possessed mother did say something about devouring their souls. Someone with a fresh soul! Huh. Kinda cliche, but it's fun, so whatever. They ask the boyfriend... And they see Annie's father, the professor, as a ghost who tells them to read the passage of the book to dispel the evil. Well, this feels more Star Wars-ish than funny or scary. You will go to the Dagobah system. So, not a fan of this plot element, but nonetheless. They have their mission, but are sidetracked by Bobby Joe getting scared by Ash's disembodied hand holding her. <laughs> kind of like another urban legend. And so Jake the Redneck threatens them to go out into the woods to find her. It's too bad he never finds out that she went the way of the trees. They just came out of the trees, man. So, how do Annie and Ash escape the clutches of the evil dead and the redneck crazy? Why, another arbitrary possession. 
He attacks them both, but is stopped by a touching moment. Though it feels stretched out to present so much emotional weight, it's at least appreciated and reminds us that there is some humanity behind the characters to contrast the antagonist. Whatever the antagonist actually is. So Annie helps Ash suit up for combat. They battle the mutating possessed undead mother, which Annie cleverly lulls the creature by reaching her mother with the same lullaby. Mockingbird. Flash kills the beast, they read the passage to summon that. If Flash has its deadlights, turning Ash into Rogue from X-Men, the creature designs look a lot like Freddy Krueger's chest. Before Annie can finish the passage, Ash's idle hand ensures no sequels for her, leaving Ash to fight the demon alone. She finishes the passage, however, before she croaks, and then the beast is sucked into a vortex. But wait! Oops! Ash gets sucked in too, bringing him to... 13th century with armored knights. A choice? And what's that? A the Dark Ages? Oh, I, I, I gotcha, yeah, you know, okay, evil and Dark Ages. No, 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 it's, it's, it's a clever idea. It's clever, it's clever, yeah. It's... You know, we were in a cabin of the woods in modern age, and now time travel. Oh, it's, it's, it's good. It's good. It's good. The knights cheer for Ash as a worshipping chant hilariously and tragically ends Ash's story. For now. So before we trade on, might as well take a quick look at the pros, cons, and the scares. The pros. More Bruce. More camera. Better effects. More creativity. All these give us more of what we love from the original, plus more. 80s cheese? Maybe not so much for the horror's sake, but fun nonetheless. Which is the reason to be watching this film to begin with. And that hand. Oh, what a delightful prop to use for creative scenarios, both horror and comedy but mostly comedy. The cons. Again, nitpick. The remake confusion. Again, this is not really a big deal, but it is odd when you see this movie for the first time. You've seen the first movie, and then you're entering the second movie wondering what's going on. It's not really clear that this is a remake until you've kind of contrasted all three films together. Again, not a big deal, just awkward. The time travel ending. Now, the movie was kind of meant to be sort of a fun ride and a little bit goofy at the same time, so, but even still, the idea is kind of way out there. But it is debatable as to whether or not this is even a con to begin with, because it did at least give us that really entertaining sequel. Ugh. Too much humor? Again, it's debatable, because no doubt some humor doesn't make a movie more or less scary. Maybe sometimes it's too much, but I mean, check out some of the terrifying episodes of Adventure Time. And the scares. Dancing Linda. Beautifully contrasted from the first scene, and maybe the claymation's a bit outdated, but it's still a very nightmarish, dreamlike sequence. The chainsaw scene. Beautifully done in building suspense. And a couple other scenes did the same thing throughout the movie, although those examples were more funny than scary. But it just goes to show you that screwing with the audience is always fun. Bruce's cerebral trip. There were just no rules, you could almost suggest horror comedy in a real psychopath's head, and that would have been pretty interesting, but just the fact that we get to see all kinds of weird reality-bending tricks made for a very entertaining section of the movie. So that was Evil Dead 2. You happy now? Indeed. Oh, what? Just don't pop up at me like that! It's in the spirit of the movie. Fair enough. And before you ask, we might as well take a look at the second sequel real quick. No doubt the third film in the original trilogy is a classic in its own right, just like its predecessors. However, whereas the first movie was more of a straight-up horror with some slight 80s camp, and the second leaned more toward a slapstick approach to the splatterhouse genre, the third is much more of a comedy with some action and horror elements. To the horror aficionado, this might be a disappointing fact, but to the general audience that just enjoys an entertaining flick, this is a memorable film. 
So because of this reason, I'm not going to dive too deep into this installment on account of the fact that it's not really horror. But as a follow-up to its two classic horror movies, it's at least worth mentioning. The story starts where the last film left off, where Ash falls into 13th century medieval Europe to fight the evil. However, whereas the last film ended with Ash being worshipped by the knights, he hasn't blasted a demon yet and so is imprisoned. Again, they made the beginning of the film like a remake. I'm seeing a pattern which makes it kind of confusing. Guess Sam Raimi was kind of fickle about his continuity. But eventually, Ash proves himself with his trusty chainsaw hand and shotgun, or his... And so he's forced by some other characters to rid them of the evil once and for all in order to return home to his own time period, which leads to hilarious moments and those awesome old special effects. So just to give you the idea of some of the awesomeness of this film, just check out some of these clips. Good. Bad. I'm the guy with the gun. I got news for you, pal. You ain't leading but two things right now. Jack and shit. And Jack left town. Shop smart. Shop S-smart. You got that? First you want to kill me. Now you want to kiss me. Blow. Groovy. Oh, dear God, it's growing bigger! <laughs> hey, uh... What's that you got on your face? Huh? Blah, blah, blah. See how that works? Plato! Mirada! <laughs> Hail to the king, baby. Lady, I'm afraid I'm gonna have to ask you to leave the store. Who the hell are you? Name's Ash. Housewares. Well, that's just what we call pillow talk, baby. So that covers the original Evil Dead trilogy. Next time, we'll tackle the modern remake that is the 2013 Evil Dead. Dude, where's that coming from? I know, right? Groovy.